Okay, let's launch in. I'd like to go back to Romans chapter uh, 5 and then Hebrews chapter 10. This is where we were last week. I'd also like to read from a couple of other places, but we'll get to that in a moment. We're talking about being disciples. And right now in this particular section, we're talking about the righteousness that is ours because of what God did. The righteousness that is ours, righteousness is not merely some Bible school topic. It is a practical, essential matter for each one of us to walk effectively in this place, okay? in this fallen place. Um, your adversary works in a certain way that you need to counteract with the revelation from Scripture about righteousness and how it works and, and what its effect is on us. And in, as is the case in so many things, the issue isn't the truth of the Word of God as much as what you personally believe. And by that I don't mean your belief is somehow valid. What I mean to say is regardless of how long you've been a Christian, how well versed you are in the Scriptures, both of those things don't necessarily add up to you believe what God says. And it is what you really believe that opens a door for Holy Spirit to move through you or opens a door for a wicked spirit to move through you. I don't mean necessarily that you're possessed, but that the devil has an opportunity to come and hit you. The fact that Jesus completely delivered us from sin and from death that he is the one who has all power and all authority doesn't keep his children, his sons and daughters, from being beaten up by the devil. And God wants us to learn to close those doors okay? and to open doors to the Holy Spirit to move through us. Okay? These matters of righteousness are more than just a doctrinal thing. People's lives are being destroyed because of lies they believe about themselves and lies they believe about God. And what God must think. But because they are believed, there is an opportunity for either Holy Spirit or the devil to do stuff. And so one of the things that God does is He sends His Word. He sends light into darkness uh, that we might not only be exposed to things that we may not have thought before, but that that Word itself would do a work in us who receive it. You know, what God wants to do goes beyond the ability of your mind, your intellect, to capture. Okay? God, of course, He deals with us where we're at. I don't mean to imply otherwise. And, of course, He has done things to make people like us be able to receive what He says. But that does not mean that all that God wants to do is limited to just what we can imagine, just our little minds, what is humanly possible. He has to bring us to a place of reverence for His Word that basically opens the door for the impossible. Okay? The things that God does in our life is to be by faith. Understanding is essential, no question. Okay? You cannot believe what you don't understand. Okay? Uh, be careful with that. I don't mean until everything is explained to you, you cannot believe. But if something that God says is completely gibberish to you, how do you put your faith in it? Okay? There can be places where a misunderstanding is keeping you from believing. Okay? So, for example, if you really sincerely believe that God controls absolutely everything and therefore you are sick because God wants it, it's going to be kind of hard for you to believe that God wants you well. And that has to get dealt with. That has to get dealt with. It's a stronghold that can be formed that keeps us from seeing what God has done for us. And sometimes the deliverance that comes from your eyes being open, open could be so fast that it seems miraculous. But what has really happened is a stronghold was brought down. Okay? So I, I say all that so that in the hopes that we don't minimize our discussion about righteousness, we, oh yeah, I already know about that. I already know about that. I mean, I'm sure that we each have some measure of understanding about righteousness and about the doctrines concerning it. But God wants us to be so completely affected by it day by day by day that righteousness is opening for us more opportunity in the Lord. Okay? If you are completely convinced that God would back you, what would you do in your life? What would you do? Who would you talk to? What thing would you take on? If you were completely, absolutely settled, God backs me in this. 
I know that what I've said is dangerous. I don't mean to imply that you go off and do whatever you want. As much as I'm trying to set the stage that eye has not seen and ear has not heard and it has not entered the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. How do we get to that place? Well, part of that involves in this matter that God says is mine, he completely backs me. He's completely for me evangelizing. He's completely for me laying my hands on someone and they, them recovering. He's completely for me resisting and pushing off the sickness that is seeking to kill me. If God completely backed me, how would I behave differently? It's worth thinking through. Unless you say, well, I behave just like I am. Then I have to say, well, there's much more available for us. Much more available for us. Okay, Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read all the way through to verse 11. Even though it's a long passage, please do give your attention. I'm going to focus on the first part. Okay? Therefore, he's just been talking about how Abraham was justified okay, by faith. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. One will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Okay? I'll just make a comment before we move to Hebrews chapter 10. Having been justified, there is no more war between us and God as far as God is concerned. We might be fighting, but God is saying, why? In Isaiah chapter 40, it says, Comfort, comfort, O my people. Tell her that she has received the double for all her sins. There is, the war has ended, my paraphrase. Okay? And when it says the double for your, for your sins, it does not mean that if you should have been slapped once, you're going to get two slaps. That is not what it means. Okay? The idea that was painted there was in a marketplace, you'd have these prices uh, displayed about how much something costs, and a guy so wealthy that the most expensive thing in the market is nothing for him. Okay? You and I might struggle with buying a $30,000 car, but for some people, that's like what they make in three seconds of breathing. There's nothing for them. Well, some, someone so wealthy came and paid the price, and they would double over the skin that uh, showed what the price here was. And what God is saying is, regardless of how deep your sin is, the debt that you owed, it's been doubled over. It's been paid for. It's been completely released. Okay? Earlier on in Isaiah, God says, come, let us reason together. Let's reason this out. Let's think about this together. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. God has done something whereby we need to come into his mind about our standing with him, what is possible for us. There is peace between us and God from God's side. And this passage in Romans chapter 5 can also be expressed as let us have peace. Because the problem in our experience is not on God's side. The moment you become born again, as far as God is concerned, everything is settled. All your sins, and I remind you, we live many hundreds and thousands of years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
Every sin you have ever committed was in the future as far as the cross is concerned. So that means even the sins of your future have been paid for. God is not going to put Jesus on the cross again when tomorrow you lie. Oh, sorry, it only covered up to the point where you were born again. All your sins were in the future. And so God has covered everything with the blood of Jesus. All your sins are forgiven you. Sin continues to be sin. It continues to destroy. But as far as God is concerned, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Why are you behaving like this? This is not who you are. And that's what Romans 6 goes on to talk about. 6, 7, 8 goes to talk about. Don't you know that you died to sin? Like why, why would you even think that continuing to be in sin is normal just because of how deep grace is? Just because of how rich grace is? Don't you know that what God did was not merely give you a second chance? It was he took away the counting of chances. You are no longer under law. You are under grace. Therefore, sin will not be master over you. Sin will be master over me? Yeah. God's not counting. God's not counting. There are some people who the moment they realize God is not counting anymore, certain things that they have been bound by in sin break. And they never have trouble with it again. Our, our approach to breaking addictions and um, habits that are sinful oftentimes boils down to try real hard. That's what it boils down to when all is said and done, however else we dress it up. And I'm not necessarily discouraging anybody from following those paths if that's what you need to do at the moment. But at the end of the day, try real hard can only take you so far. What God has done pulls the carpet underneath from that whole way of thinking. I'm not counting anymore. It's been covered. It's been covered. You can commit that sin 18,000 times. As far as I'm concerned, you're forgiven. He doesn't say, go ahead and commit it 18,000 times. But he wants to bring us into his mind about what the blood of Jesus has accomplished. The more you are affected by what the blood of Jesus has accomplished, the less easy it is for sin to hold you. It's an astonishing thing. The mastery over sin is not discipline. It is grace. It is grace. Where we are struggling with some kind of sin, and I don't have to uh, uh, pretend that we don't do that, okay? And I'll go further. There are some sins that everybody says, oh. There are other things that I have no problem with that God says, oh my goodness, I wish he would stop it. I haven't, come, I haven't come to that place yet where it bothers me like it bothers him. But whatever it is, I, what I'm trying to paint is there are some sins that are, oh, they're really bad. So-and-so is a homosexual. Oh. Just it's a very much as a side. Okay, this is really an aside. I'm not going to talk about this. Did you know that there is no difference in the eyes of God between homosexuality in terms of its cost and a lie. Okay? We, in our society, and maybe not necessarily out of bad reason, homosexuality has an effect on society that is deeper than a lie might have. But as far as sin is concerned, sin is sin is sin. And the same sacrifice that Jesus made covered it all. And so we should not be thinking about uh, one article I read. Somebody said, homosexuality is a sin. But homosexuality is just a sin. It's no different than all the others. Okay? But you know what our society is like. Let's say there was somebody who's uh, part of a church, and they've been Christian, and they're supposed to be Christian, but secretly they're struggling with this. Secretly they're struggling with this. And so their approach, because they don't want anybody to find out, is try even harder. Don't I mean, do, and, and every time they stumble, it's like, oh, again. And the devil has an opportunity to come in and hit them even harder. And the last thing they are thinking here is, I have no problem with you, says the Lord. I have a problem with what you're doing. That is never, uh, that has not been sanctified. Okay? Uh, Christian sin is still sin. But as far as God is concerned, that person remains precious and redeemed. You just don't realize it. And so the secret to those sorts of things is not programs, though, again, I don't mean to keep anybody from going into whatever they need to do to help themselves where they're at. The secret is this. 
you will no longer be mastered by sin because you are not under law, you are under grace. Sin shall not be master over you, for you are no longer under law, you are under grace. That is going to be the key for release of anybody who is bound, whatever the bondage might be at the end of the day. I understand that spirits can uh, have an op you know, take an opportunity by the things that we do, and so sometimes we do need help, a spirit being cast out of us. But once the spirit is cast out, are you aware he can come back? If you do the same things again, you need something more than a spirit cast out. Jesus himself said, you know, a spirit gets cast out. He goes and wanders the, the dusty places and he says, I'm just going to go back and see what's going on. And he comes back and he finds that the house that he was living in before is all tidied and clean. So he goes and gets four more and comes back and, and the situation of the person is even worse than before. Jesus also said, unless the strong man is bound, that means much more than a simple prayer. Something has to change about you so that the devil has no more opportunity in that area. So it involves a casting out of a spirit, sure, but it also involves a person coming to grips with, what has Jesus done for me that this is no longer normal? Without that second part, a person is going to have this experience of repeatedly stumbling in these things, and that is not what God wants for you or me. Right? God is the God who delivers us, not helps us past all our hiccups. Now, he has no problem with it when it's just this hiccup stuff. But understand, it is not what you've been consigned to. It is not what you're destined for. It is not what you've been purposed for. God is just going to show people how patient he is through me. And by that I mean I'm never going to overcome this. I'm never going to overcome it. God will just have to show how merciful he is because I'm doubting myself that he's merciful, but I'm still breathing, so he must be merciful again. And we get all these twisted ideas. We, we fall short of the glory of God, if I could put it that way. Okay? I, wanna show, I, want, I want you to recognize at least one thing from this passage in Romans. Whatever he's saying about justification, its consequence in our life, if we are on, in tune with him, is an exalting over the expectation of the glory of God showing up to help me, I exult in hope of the glory of God. A rejoicing and an exulting in tribulation. Okay? Not a, I'm supposed to rejoice here, but there is something that you have come to understand about what Jesus did on the cross that causes you to say, even in tribulation, I exult. And exult is much more than, I have to be happy here, I have to be happy here. I have to be happier. It is this violent rejoicing over God has saved me, and this is nothing for him. And so much so, he brings his mind, I don't care what's happening. I'm just going to exult in hope of the glory of God. In tribulation, I just exult in God himself. Okay? Whatever you think about righteousness, if its effect is not this continual rejoicing over God himself is mine, and he's going to help me, you haven't come far enough. I'm just taking what Romans chapter 5 says. Please, by all means, I do not expect you to accept something to be true because I said it. Okay? I am opposed to the idea that something is true because of a person that we like saying something. Okay? A person we like may say something that's true, but the fact that we like them, I don't, I'm assuming you like me, that is, the fact that we like them is not proof that what they're saying is true. You need to be like the Bereans. Go and search the scriptures. See, is the, are these things so? I'm telling you, there is a deeper work of righteousness in, that needs to continue in us if our reaction to life is not hallelujah. Okay, I understand. We're, sometimes we're tired. We get down. I'm not talking about the, how we react in a single moment. I'm talking about the story of your life. Is your life a... Oh, help me, God. Or is there this building, oh, Father, you are with me even in this? You know, there might be this momentary, oh, no, I've done it again. Oh, hallelujah, you will even turn this to my good. See, the effect of the sacrifice of Jesus, put it differently, the effect of righteousness is a confidence that God will help me. Okay? Now, it is worth saying, you know, there's a, there's a pattern here, right? And it says, 
And not only this, we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. I think that was five steps, if, I'm, if I counted correctly. Okay? So this is not a once and you're done, but rather it is a, a work of God in us where something is developed. And what is developed? A hope that is unshakable. Whatever happens, you are unshakable. That doesn't happen because you're a Christian. It happens because you open yourself up to the work of the Holy Spirit's ministry concerning the righteousness that is yours by Jesus. You know, a cold word, uh, cold word, a way of thinking about righteousness should be, does God back me? Again, not back whatever wicked scheme I come up with. Me. Is God for me? Is God for me? Okay. So now, before we go to um, Hebrews chapter 10, I'd like to jump way back to Genesis chapter 3. But on your way, stop at Psalm 91. Okay. Psalm 91. This is a reminder of the context of Genesis chapter 3. Okay. Plus, I just like it. I just, I'm just so enthralled by what he says here. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. I'm reading this in the NASB. I think the King James is even more descriptive. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. He who dwells in the shelter or the secret place of the Most High will abide under His shadow. Okay? Genesis chapter 3. By way of context, God has made everything. He has made man. It tells us in Genesis chapter 2 that man and woman were naked. No problem. They were completely naked. Okay? Genesis chapter 3, the serpent, okay, the devil, comes. And he cannot overpower Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve have been given dominion. Right? You have dominion over the earth. So he can't come and overpower them, but he sure can talk. Okay? He comes and he starts up a conversation with Eve. Okay? That's always the first, that's already a red flag should go up for us. Okay? The moment that liar comes and you hear a lie, be warned. Y you might think he's attacking here, but he's actually coming over here. Okay? This is just a smoke screen to get what he really wants. Okay? Anyway, you know, you know the story. Um, he starts up a conversation with Eve. Eve responds. It leads to Adam and Eve taking of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and eating. Okay? They did the one thing God said, do not do. Do not do this. I mean, I wish we had time. There's just what how amazing God is. Like, I sometimes stop and think, you know, God knew what Adam would do. It's, uh, you know, Adam may not have known what he was going to do, but God knew what he was going to do before he made Adam, and yet he still went ahead and made Adam. You know, I was thinking about this. Did you know our bodies have an immune system? It wasn't necessary before the fall. It was almost like God, knowing I know what exactly what he's going to do, put things into place ahead of time. And I sometimes think to myself, if, if I knew that this creature that I love would do this, would I have made them? And I always find myself saying, like, oh, I, I would never do that. Why would I? Why would, why? But there is, you know, that, that's because I think about things as a man and not God. And there is a, a depth to the wisdom and the love of God. And I think it's especially the love of God that could see this is what will happen, but I'll take care of it. All the pain and all the suffering that would come about was swallowed up by what Jesus did. That's how I imagine that God thinks about this. One person says he saw 
all the people who would believe and said that would be still worth all this pain and suffering. What Jesus will accomplish, what Jesus will bring about is more than worth all the trouble that will be if I make this man. Anyway, that was, my, that was another, another aside. So Adam sins. He takes of the fruit and he eats. The scriptures say that Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned. Okay? It was to Adam that was told, do not do this. Okay? So do not blame Eve beyond what part she has. It was Adam who sinned. And here, in verse 7, this is verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and, a and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like for God? I, oh, what a stupid question, as if we could imagine. He already knows where they are. He knows what they've done. He sees it, and he steps in acting as if nothing has happened to give them a chance. To give them a chance. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave from the tree and I ate. And already we see the effect of sin. Okay? Already we see the effect of sin. Uh, only it was... <laughs> the first reaction that sin produces in us is it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Already we are... You, what, what are you seeing here? You're seeing the effect of having been separated from God. Okay? When God said, you will surely die, like not maybe, maybe not, you will surely die, he clearly was not talking about their physical death, because Adam went on to live another 900 years at least. Okay? But they died. You right away see the separation. And I think it's interesting that God asks them, who told you you were naked? Were they any more or less naked after eating than they were before? They, they didn't like have clothes before and now they are naked. But they became aware of something. And that awareness made them hide. Right? And God, it does not say, and then God told them, you are naked, so go hide. It, was, it says here that the eyes of their heart were opened. Well, their eyes were opened, excuse me. What eyes? Like, were they blind before? Were they walking around with their eyes shut? Or is he saying they became aware of something on the inside that they were not aware of before, before there was a fall? Something happened to make them aware that they cannot be in the presence of God. They have to hide. They have to be... They, there was this consciousness that made them say, I can't be there anymore. I have to hide. He is going to be mad. Okay? Now think about this. Up to that point in time, God had never, ever, ever, ever done anything that would give them the reason he's going to be mad. Okay? God was never mean. He was never cruel. He was never snappy. He did, was not ever having a bad day. He was never impatient. Nothing. They had no basis to say, we got to hide. We got to hide. Nothing. But an awareness within them made them behave that way. Okay? Why I read Psalm 91 is I wanted to again emphasize the secret of our life is not that we know about righteousness or that we understand about forgiveness or that we pray to prayer, the secret of our life is this. 
we who were dead, separated from God, have been brought back to him. And he is the secret of life. So the reason why righteousness is such a big deal, the reason why any of the things that we talk about is such a big deal, is because it interferes with this. And it must be dealt with. Because God himself is our life. Okay? Teaching is not life. Doctrine is not life. Your connection with him is the source of life and healing and provision and understanding and wisdom and courage and everything. Okay? That's what was lost in the garden. That's what Jesus recovered for us. And so all of our discussions about righteousness and what we need to do with our conscience are with this in view. God wants you to live in this continual fellowship with him. That is the source of your life. This is why, you know, if we're born with a disability or a learning, what do you call it, a learning, what do you call it when you have trouble weeding or something like that, a learning dyslexia, dyslexia something like that, okay? Or um, whatever it might be, that need not be a problem, okay? Yes, I may have dyslexia, but I'm joined to God, okay? And so my dyslexia becomes a mechanism by which God shows I make the difference. I make up for anything lacking. I am Jehovah Jireh. That doesn't just mean, oh yeah, you need more money. I, get. I see and I provide before you need it. I am all that you need. I am all that you need. And I'm a walking testimony of that, so to speak. You know, here I am, I can't read, but God, look at what God is doing through me. The secret of our life is not anything other than you've been joined back to Him. And anything that interferes with that will hinder you living. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10. Last week I said a couple things. I think I might have said them sloppily, so let me restate them. First of all, I said that if your life goes up and down and up and down and up and down based on circumstance, then Jesus is not Lord in your life. Um, I should have been more careful to say in that area, Jesus is not Lord in your life because what is driving you is your circumstance. Simple as that. Okay? The sooner you realize that, the sooner that can be dealt with. A person whose life goes up and down, up and down. When everything is going great, hallelujah, God is so worthy. When everything is going badly, where is God? You know what? You're still just a child. And your life in that matter is being ruled by something other than Jesus. The moment you decide to let Jesus be Lord there and act as if it was, your life is transformed. Your life is transformed. Some of this has to do with the effect of trial causing you to mature. But just going through a trial does not mean you mature. Do you understand that? Just because you go through a trial doesn't mean you end up choosing God any more than before. But trial gives you the opportunity. Okay? And as we read in Romans chapter 5, tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings about proven character. Proven character brings about a hope that does not shake with circumstance. It's okay. I'm having a really bad week this week. But God is just so kind to me. He's keeping me and he's patient. This will work out. This will work out. This will work out. But don't be fooled. If at the tribulation stage you start kicking your feet up and saying, <laughs> guess what? You stay there at the next time too. Because Jesus is not Lord in that area of your life. Okay, so that's, that's true. I'm sorry. I wish it was the other, some other way. Where your life goes up and then down, and up and then down, God is calling you to say, hey, let me rule this part of your life. I am good all the time, and all the time I'm good, whether your circumstances tell you that or not. The sooner you embrace that, the sooner your life starts to lose the oscillations and begin to steady out. Okay? The second thing I said was, that there is no passage in the scripture that shows the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. And I stand by that, okay? I invite you again, be Bereans and look. I can think of one passage that talks about Holy Spirit's ministry of conviction, but it is to the world. And in that context, it's pretty clear the world does not include us who believes. I'm just telling you what, what is there, okay? I'm not willing to make a, min, uh, a statement that says, Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you of your sin. Something else does. Holy Spirit is present in your life. I'm not trying to imply that Holy Spirit doesn't care about sin in your life. That's not what I'm saying. 
But what I am trying to get across is the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life is not to point out all that you're doing wrong. It is not. It is not. Okay? And I will go all the way back to Genesis to point that out. Who told you you were naked? I didn't. The living God did not come and say, you're naked. You're a messed up sinner. You're naked. And then God the Father comes along and says, who told you you're naked? As if he didn't know. No. It was not God that made them aware of their fallen nature. It was not God. Okay. Now, fast forward, because there's a lot there we could talk about. I will stand by it. Again, I invite you, please, bring a scripture that shows Holy Spirit is the one who says, this is wrong in your life. This is wrong in your life. This is wrong in your life. I would rather make the case, Holy Spirit is the one who says, let me build this up in your life. Let me build this in your life. Let me build this in your life. Okay? And I am not saying that there is no such thing as a discipline from God. Okay? Those things are true. I'm just telling you from what the scriptures say, and all of you here are intelligent, you, you are familiar with the scriptures, you have Bible tools available to you, find a passage otherwise. The passage I'm thinking about is in John chapter 16. But, be that as it may, Hebrews chapter 10, and here's where we're going to end. There is this thing within us that can make us aware of something being wrong in us, and it is not always working properly. Okay? That was the effect of the fall. You see, that thing, if, if we could go back to the garden, when God said, Adam, where are you? Or even before God said, Adam, where are you? If Adam had taken the fruit, ate it, and said, oh my goodness, and he ran back to the Lord, I contend the world would be very different. Okay? In the, in the narr narrative, in the story that is written there in Genesis for us, it's God who has to keep asking him, where are you? Did you eat? At no point did he say, yes, I was wrong. Forgive me. He says, well, we were naked, so we're hiding. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree? Because God knew that's exactly how you knew you were naked. Well, she, she gave it to me. And then she asked Eve, what did you do? Well, the serpent tricked me. At no point do they say, I am wrong. I am wrong. If we could go one step further, if we had time, we could look at the story of Cain. You know, Cain, next week, because we don't have time. The story of Abel and Cain is a depiction of the extraordinary kindness and the grace of God and man's defiance in the face of it. Cain is about, I will be righteous my way and the problem that it causes. And even though we may not be the sons of Cain, we have to learn his lesson. If you try to be righteous, if you try to cleanse that sense within you that says, I'm not right with God, your own way, practice harder, be more diligent, get a prayer buddy, whatever. And I'm not, again, the, the thing that has to be careful here is sometimes you do need someone to come alongside you. So I'm not trying to criticize that. But the solution to these things is not some human effort. The solution to this is a believing in what Jesus has accomplished and applying it on a day-by-day, -day, as necessary basis. Hebrews chapter 10, and we have enough time to read it, and then I'll say a couple things and we'll stop. Verse 19 of chapter 10, it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. I hope you can see that Romans chapter 5 verse 1 steps right into Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. Okay? We have confidence to enter the holy place. He inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And he goes on to talk about how this all continues to work out. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Okay? There is a part that the rest of the church 
uh, must play in your life to help you progress and what you must play in their lives to help them progress. Okay? There is this helping one another, stirring one another up. But I draw your attention to having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. What is an evil conscience? It is a thing within you that is aligning itself with what is evil as opposed to what is good. And let's be more specific. It is the thing within you that says you are evil. When your adversary, the devil, recognizes that you have sinned, he pounces. He pounces. He takes, as we said before, you give him, you give him a, a, a fraction of an inch, he takes 10 miles. At least he tries to. And the first thing he will do is to, again, make you think you are separated from God. You are separated from God. Okay? Now, I, again, we don't have time. We would go to 1 John chapter 1 where it says, and if we sin, we have someone who will faithfully and righteously forgive us our sins when we confess. So by no means should you conclude, I'm saying, it doesn't matter, you never did anything wrong, it's just what you're thinking. When you sin, you give the devil an opportunity. The devil never fails to take it. What do you do? Two things have to be dealt with. You need to confess your sin. There's no question about that. But by the way, you know what God's reaction is going to be already. Okay? Because you were already forgiven. Okay? He's not going to make up his mind yet again. Okay, look. Fifteen times I've forgiven you. Sixteen, too far for me. You will never hear God say that. But that's what the devil wants you to think. This separates you from God. This separates you from God. That is an evil conscience. A conscience is the thing within us that discerns what is right, what is wrong. It can confirm the things of God. It can confirm this is not what I should be doing. Okay? And so the danger of a seared conscience is it doesn't work like that anymore. And you open yourself up to that which is wicked and will harm you, but you have so consistently rejected the conscience saying, hey, don't do this, 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 don't do this. You don't hear it anymore. So that's a dangerous situation to be in. But we can also simply be accused. The purpose of accusation is to keep you separate from God. The purpose of accusation, you did this wrong. And by the way, the accusation can be correct. I did do this. But the purpose of accusation, there's nothing the devil can do to undo what Jesus did on the cross. Right? He cannot. There's nothing he can do. What the blood has done, it has done. It has done. So accusation cannot undo that. But what it can do, if you're not careful, is for all intents and purposes, separate you from God. And instead of running to him, you hide. Who told you you were naked, Titus? Because I didn't. Who told you that what you did is legitimate to keep you away from me? Because I did not. This is why it matters. What is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life? Is it to point out what you've done wrong? Or is it to bring you back to Him? And He says we need to have our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. It is a deliberate daily application by faith of the blood that Jesus shed for us speaking on our behalf. And we must develop, cultivate this practice of day by day, moment by moment, I am doing what I'm doing because of the blood of Jesus speaking on my behalf. So at my worst, when I'm feeling really down, Father, I'm coming to you, not on the grounds that I'm feeling great, I'm just having an up day and hallelujah, but because of the blood of Jesus is speaking on my behalf. And so whether I feel it or not, I thank you that I am not separate from you. My mind feels like it's so far away from you, but I thank you that I am not because of the blood of Jesus, I deliberately choose, Father. I ask you to sprinkle my conscience to reset me that I can hear you again, that I can be refreshed in you again, because you are my life. The devil is not merely after burdening you with lots of sin. He is after you being separate in your mind from God so that you don't run to him. 
Because you and God can take on anything, even the worst of your mistakes. Okay, case in point, David. How would you like to be the guy or the woman in the Bible whose sin is publicly recorded for everybody else to read from there on forever and ever? And yet the last words of David do not even re reference what happened. The last words that are recorded of David say something to the effect of, look at my life. Isn't it full? Isn't it full? The worst of your sins, the devil wants to become so big that you do not run to God, but God gives us a provision, the blood of Jesus, and you must deliberately apply. So Father, we set me here. Here I am being tempted to think that you are away from me when that cannot be because the blood of Jesus is speaking. So I choose to enter your gates with thanksgiving. I choose to come boldly. The effect of righteousness is a confidence before God that is not rooted in your behavior, but rooted in your believing what Jesus did. That's what we're talking about here. It is essential for your continued fellowship with God and therefore essential for your healing, for your uh, provision in money, for your confidence applying for work, for whatever it might be. The confidence that we have is that the blood of Jesus is speaking on my behalf and I need to deliberately reset as often as necessary. Sin wants to keep you away from God. God sees no reason for it. Okay? You will not say, oh, you know what, I would, I would just love to pour out on you. But you did this. And so I'm not, sure what we can, I'm not sure how we go on from here. Maybe we'll work something out. That is not God. At the risk of going overboard, the father delighted over the prodigal son long before the prodigal son came back. Father did not decide to delight over the prodigal son when he saw him. His reaction clearly tells you his delight over him had never ended. So God is not thinking, well, we'll see about that next time. He delights over you coming back. So you sin. You do something terrible. It's terrible. It might have life-changing consequences for you and for other people. But God thinks you should come boldly. And where you don't, it tells you that your conscience has been affected by something other than what the blood of Jesus is saying. Do you remember Hebrews chapter 12? We have come to the blood that is speaking better than the blood of Abel. And the blood of Abel cried out to God for vengeance. But the blood of Jesus says, finished. And that's what we have to be attuned to. Okay? So we'll continue from here, Lord willing, next week. Um, but in the meantime, please, run to the Lord on nothing other than the blood says this about me. Who told you you're stupid? Who told you you're a failure? Who told you that you are separated from God? Who told you that God is disappointed with you? Who told you? Pff, what a waste of time you are. Who told you that? Because it wasn't God. And that's the important thing. It was not God. What does God say? Forgiven. Mine. Delighted over. Oh, I want to show you the things I want to do in you and through you. That's what we have to be attuned to. Okay? So please, don't leave righteousness in the, in, the, in the recess of your mind as doctrines to be understood. It is a practical thing for everyday life because the secret of our life is that we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And whatever gets in the way of that gets in the way of abiding in His shadow which is where we're to, make, where to live. Okay? Thank you for your time.